once I'm not good enough to play football, like the option was, okay, how do I do, how do I get a career that means I can like sort of do this? Making these drivers see like, seem like real human beings. I think that's always been an interest of mine. I think I had a day where someone in the morning called me a Hamilton fan and someone in the evening called me a Verstappen fan. So in my mind, I'm doing something right because like they're both annoyed. So I must be talking to the truth. There's a lot of times we don't know the news is coming and we've got to react to it there and then. So I work unusual hours to like try and enjoy the time off I have, but it's very much like a 24 seven job. So like F1 itself is owns the commercial rights and it's the Formula One group. FIA hasn't always painted themselves in the best light. Like I mentioned, like the Abu Dhabi stuff obviously set a lot of fans looking at them in a negative light. I see a pineapple on the pizza without ham. So like I naturally just can't have it. Hello and welcome to another fantastic episode of Georgie's Stripping the Dipping podcast. I'm your unusual co-host, Steph One Blag, and today we've got a fantastic guest. If you've ever wondered about what it's like to work in F1 media, to be a journalist in motorsport, then look no further because today we have Sam Cooper. Sam, how are you doing? How's it going? I'm very good, thanks. Yeah, very happy to be invited on. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. No, well, um, thanks for joining. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, about your story today. We always ask a couple of sort of standard intro questions. So like, Sam, if you were introducing yourself to, to someone new, what would you say? Who, who are you, Sam? Okay, yeah, um, I'm a journalist. I work for a website called Planet F1. So it, it, the name's on the tin, so you can sort of guess what I cover. Yeah, it's uh, F1 focus. Yeah, that's my, that's my nine to five, really, even though it's not a very typical nine to five. And to be honest, I rarely work nine to five. So yeah, that's sort of me and that's who I am. That was literally going to be my first question. Like, is it really a nine to five? But like, we'll get into that in a bit. Um, so like, you're clearly uh, in Formula One now. I'm guessing you're passionate, therefore, about the sport. What's your first sort of F1 memory? Yeah, sure. Um, I think if your listeners can't tell, I'm British. So obviously my view of the sport goes through that. And I remember in the early days, it was it was sort of Michael Schumacher. But then I think the sport over here... Look, just sort of exploded once Lewis Hamilton was on the scene. Obviously, having a British driver doing well and a, a driver that came in as a rookie, really, like, as, as we all know the story of Hamilton, like, that sort of gripped the nation. I think there was my early memories of F1 and then sort of always had a passing interest. And then I think just, like, I don't know, about 10 years ago, like, really ramped up. So, obviously, you had, like, Sebastian Vettel and then you sort of move into the era we're in now really where you've got you've got max lewis is still there obviously and like yeah i think i'd say early 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 memories it was it was michael schumacher but i think the first time i sort of really like took on board the sport was definitely when hamilton was around like i said the media over here just went a bit nuts really because i think everyone was dying to have a, a british champ back yeah i think you've you've kind of aged me there sam because my first memory of the sport is probably around the time when Ayrton Senna died and please don't tell me how old you were or the fact that you were not existing right. on this planet when that happened <laughs> okay <laughs> i'll keep, so I'll keep it to myself <laughs> exactly keep shum on that one right okay fantastic so like <laughs> so i guess like fast forward you talked about sort of early memories thing ramping up about 10 years ago and and yet today you're a journalist in in motorsport and i know that a lot of people at home will be really interested about that that journey so sort of did you always know you wanted to go into media into journalism like what what got you into that sort of field oh yeah definitely like I, I'll admit and say it wasn't to initially to go into motorsport journalism like I'm, I'm a big uh football fan as like a most a lot of people are and I think re I realized once I'm not good enough to play football like the option was okay how do I do how do I get a career that means I can like sort of do this and naturally like, I sort of arrived at journalism and um i think i was about 16 or so I, I basically just started up a blog about football and i sort of maybe just got a bit better at writing and then went off to uni got a bit more experience and then eventually my first actual journalism job was for a very local newspaper in my area so the stuff i was reporting on was very very low level it wasn't anything anywhere near professional it was all people who have jobs during the week and go out and play games and stuff on the weekend and then eventually I got a job in London which is where I live now and that was my sort of my first time writing about F1 properly so I, 
obviously got to use my passion for the first time, which was nice. So just writing about them. And then about a year, year and a half ago is when I first started writing for Planet F1 and sort of it's just really kicked on from there. So obviously going to race it, do a lot of the a lot of the people on the track and just yeah, it's just really ramped up since then. So yeah, it's been it's been an enjoyable ride. It's been it feels like it's gone by in a flash, but I think yeah, I'm enjoying it so far. Well, no, I'm really pleased you are. And, and it's really intriguing because, you know, whether you, I don't know, take, hope you take this as a compliment. We interviewed uh, Ben Hunt and his story was quite similar uh, mm. in that he was really passionate about football. He really loved uh, Wimbledon, the original Wimbledon, which again, I'm not going to ask you where mm. you were when the original Wimbledon <laughs> died, but or moved to Milton Keynes. We'll, we'll gloss over that. But like, um, he, yeah, started reporting really locally on football and on sport and then, uh, was snapped up into the sun. So it's re- it's really interesting you came a, a similar route. And um, I guess, like, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm not famous for anything in my life, but what I'm infam- infamous for on this podcast is doing a little bit of LinkedIn stalking. Um, and I can see, did you work for, like, some fairly big publications, right? The Mail, The Independent? Yeah, right? definitely, yeah. I did a lot of freelance for those guys, yeah. So, like, I went to the often worked in the the male newsroom which is quite an experience it was like probably one of the busiest rooms i've ever been in it's just how frantic is everything going on especially their print deadline would be about 10 p.m at night so if there for example if there was a football game on the evening it was sort of a mad rush to get everything ready for that so yeah I've, yeah it's, it's, it's been interesting to see how sort of these these big nationals work i think i've sort of more enjoyed the role i'm in currently just i think it's a little bit more relaxed and i think personally i like i like to get into a lot of longer projects so i quite like features and stuff like that and i know you don't always get the time for that if you're working for one of those big newspapers so yeah i think sort of happy where i am absolutely and and yeah it's it's really intriguing um you know like we could probably talk for a while about um and i don't know if our listeners love that but um that transformation that's going on in media because you know if you go back 20, 30 years, there were like a smaller number of voices, but for much larger organizations. And now you've got the likes of Planet F1, who, you know, brand wise, I would say they're an authority. Uh, you know, if you look on Twitter or, you know, just generally online, if you if you just Google, um, you know, qualifying or, you know, Austrian Grand Prix, whatever, you're likely to see a Planet F1 article come up. So, I mean, do you, how do you feel about that transformation? You, you've kind of lived it. Like, do you see that change happening or do you think we're still likely to have those big nationals for, for the time being? Oh, that's a good question. I think nationals will always have a place. And I think definitely today, at least, they're still sort of, they seem like another level, really. So I put this as an example, like if if I requested an interview with whoever really and then say if a national did i think obviously the nationals are just more likely to get it through the prestige they've got but i think i think media is like really quite exciting like like you said we've got so many people who can do just more things and produce more content and like fair enough it's not always the best content but i think the fact there's more people working in the sport like more opinions more voices i think that can only really be a good thing and like the fact that planet f1 ranks quite highly is like it's a skill in itself. Like we work quite hard on SEO and stuff like that, like making sure that we're doing everything we can to sort of rival the big papers and the big boys really. So yeah, like I think it is an interesting time. I think I've sort of, like I said, I've sort of lived through it where uh, when I was very young, obviously like iPhones and stuff wasn't, a, a, weren't around. So it's been interesting how, how much the sports changed even during that time. So yeah, I think I'm excited to see where sort of where it goes. And I think you're just going to get more and more, people setting up their own websites, setting up their own YouTube channels, doing a podcast like this. I think that's that's great. And yeah, I've, I think it's an exciting time to be involved, really. No, absolutely. There's kind of a, I guess, a democratization to some extent of if you've got something interesting to say, it's more likely that you're going to be found now, even if you're outside of the big, um, you know, major um, corporations. But let's not downplay Planet F1. I mean, like, I don't know if this is deliberate, Sam, and maybe like you can tell me the strategy, but if I'm going on Google Images and I'm looking for like, okay, I need a picture of Lewis Hamilton or whatever, more often than not, it's going to have a Planet F1 like hallmark on it. Is that like part of the strategy or is it just like a happy coincidence? Uh, yeah, I'd say it's definitely part of the strategy. Um, obviously, I think for any 
any company like ours, you've sort of you've got to really sort of play Google's game. Like they have certain things they want to see, and like to be honest, they change quite a lot. So I've obviously got people above me, like my editor and my his his boss, who really like delve into it, and they'll often come to me and saying, "Okay, we should be doing this with our articles now." And like I think that's really crucial because if we if we didn't do that, we'd be much lower down on google so like if you did search for an image we wouldn't be there and then ultimately that means people don't come what comes to our website and obviously we don't get the advertising clicks so we're not allowed to we can't we don't have the budget and stuff to to employ people like me or to like go to events go to races so yeah i think i think you just got to do that in this in this era really that you've got to like i said play the game really you've got to know what google wants and obviously you've got to know what twitter wants and facebook and all that stuff like just making sure you can use all these tools because in comparison to um, a, a newspaper, like we're obviously not printing our website. There's not a definite, we don't know every day that we're going to send out this many copies of our website, unlike a newspaper, which will print copies and copies and you can always sort of rely on it. Yes. You might sell different, different amounts during a different day, but like at the end of the day, you still know someone's going to see it on a newsstand. Whereas for us, it's, I, I guess you could sort of think of like Google as like the virtual digital newsstand really like, we want to make sure we're at the front row of that. So if people come come to F1, even if it's, I think that's something we also try and do on a site is is um have something there for people who've loved F1 for years, who've sort of done it, who've, who know it, who everyone is, but also how do we cater for the new fans that have come into the sport? Because as, as you both know, like it's exploded in the last few years. Like there's a lot of American fans interested in it. And so we, we sort of want to make sure they feel they've got a place on our website as well. So yeah, you sort of, you don't end up making two different articles for the same story, but you will maybe have both audiences in mind when you sort of you're writing something. It's like really intriguing. I mean, in the virtual green room, we kind of had a quick chat about like, you know, saying hello. And, and we, we kind of touched on a point about like, it's not about not upsetting people, but there's certainly something around being cognizant of what people are interested in, what their kind of positive triggers are and so on. Like, so when you're, when you're writing a story, clearly if you went super dry and just went fact-based, that might not be the most, I don't know, entertaining or engaging way to write something. So, you know, without giving all of your uh, tricks of the trade away, like you're writing a story, let's say it's about qualifying or, I, I mean, you tell me, like, what is it that you're trying to inject into a story to make it kind of catch people's eye? I think you've always got a lead on the narrative. So if, if we just said, oh, I don't know, like, Max Verstappen wins the race like that that's quite dull like if if you're reading that you're just thinking oh great this is interesting but if you sort of put the background on it like so for example this season it'd be like oh this incredible run that's going on just making sort making these drivers see like seem like real human beings I think that's always been an interest of mine not just in F1 but in sport in general really like yes we see these people play the sport or whatever or get in the cars and stuff like that but they're also people like they'll have their lives they have their certain dislikes they like they maybe there's drivers they don't like maybe there's other drivers they get on with and like how does that affect their on track uh, mannerisms and i think a show like drive to survive yes it gets a lot of criticism for maybe not portraying the truth as much as it as much it should, as it should but at the same time it's made these drivers especially this generation of drivers just a lot more relatable like we sort of know every driver and sort of what he likes and sort of who he who he's friends with and i think if i'm writing an article that's sort of what I'm trying to say to the readers is like, why is this significant? Yes, Alonso's come second on the podium. If you read that, that might not be interest that interesting. But if you say this is the very experienced man, it's like the absolute F1 veteran. He spent so many years not not on the podium after winning those two more titles, and now he's back on the podium, sort of making a point that this, this is the story behind behind the data, really. And I think that's sort of our job, and like. Obviously, AI is a big thing, but I think AI would struggle to to find the meaning behind just a load of numbers of where drivers finish on a certain weekend. That's a really important or interesting point about that human element. And, and yeah, also about like how maybe AI at the moment can't replicate that. So, I mean, um, you're, you're clearly thinking about the human angle. You, you, you talked a bit about football at the beginning and that being one of your passions as well. I don't know if you'd agree with me. I think that in Formula One, people follow drivers and less so teams. And clearly in football, it's like, my view is it's the other way around. Would you agree with that? Or do you think that there are 
a kind of cohort of people that are staunch fans of particular teams? Um, no, I'd largely agree with that. And I think I, I'd say from the, except from the likes of like Ferrari, McLaren and Williams, like teams have been around for a long, long time. I think the rest of the teams, like you said, they're sort of the drivers to pull them in. I guess, I guess one of the reasons would be that is, I know it hasn't happened for a while, but F1 teams used to change names or change ownership quite often. So you could be a fan of this team for one year and then the next year they're called completely, they're completely different, owned by someone different, like in different colours with different drivers. So whereas in football, other than obviously the Wimbledon example that we brought up earlier, but generally these clubs have been there for a hundred odd years. So you support the club and they're not going anywhere. But I think drivers are just more, I guess you just get more attracted to them quite easily. Like you hear their stories and like if they're moving across the team, like obviously Fernando Alonso has got a load of fans and he's been to so many different teams in his career and they've all followed him with him. So yeah, I think that would be one of the main reasons just these teams do change quite often. I know it hasn't happened since uh, Aston Martin got rebranded. Oh, sorry. Racing Point got rebranded to Aston Martin, but I think in general, yeah, that's sort of the main difference I'd think between why people, like you said, support teams more often in football and maybe less so in less so in um, F1. Yeah, no, I think that's a huge point about those changes. And obviously Alpine uh, sort of being the rebrand of Renault, albeit with the same sort of parent company. Um, to, to tell us a bit more about these long form or longer term projects that you're really passionate about, these kind of features, like what is a feature what makes a good feature and what are the sort of things that you're thinking about at the moment on that front? Yeah. Um, yeah. I probably should have explained the feature before. Um, it's basically like not a standard news article. So it might be reacting to something on the news, but it's sort of a lot more opinion based and just generally longer form. And I think one of my favorite ones I ever wrote was um, I spoke to Jackie Stewart. Uh, he had his movie out, I think end of last year and just like, hearing his stories because his like we think we think of formula one as this dangerous sport now but like hearing some of the stories that at the time he was in was it's just another level it's just completely mad the stuff he went through and he was he was listing the people he used to race with and like the amount of them that, that died on the racetrack was just crazy and then obviously he was one that was really at the forefront for pushing safety and like it sounds like obvious to us now through this modern lens but he was getting a a load of abuse for it back then and I think that was one of the articles I was most proud of is just sort of reflecting his story and like how how much he's done for the sport other than his world titles and I think that's like I said like I mentioned earlier like I've always been interested in the human element behind these things like I want to know about these drivers I want to know like why they do it like why do they strap themselves to essentially rocket on wheels and fly around a track 18 19 even 22 times a year like what is it that drives them to do that? And I think, I think also like I'm sort of interested in what goes on away from the drivers. Like we think about Formula One and like it's easy to think of the drivers and maybe the team principals, but there's there's hundreds and thousands of people who work to get an F1 race on at the weekend. Like it's easy to see a track one weekend on the TV and then see another one and just sort of think that's seamless. But if you look on it on a map, like they've gone from I don't know like Austria to to Britain like how does that happen like how how does that work and I think those are the stories that I'm most most interested in really like sort of the I like obviously I love the the racing like I'm I love doing reports and stuff like that but I think when you get the time to really put in a lot of work and a lot of effort into a feature you sort of feel quite proud of it at the end of it if it, if it comes out how you like it really no that makes a lot of sense and it's all about sort of telling the story I guess uh, and, and you know, you're paid to do that. So you're like a professional storyteller, I guess. Um, and, and, and you know, Jackie Stewart is a fantastic example. I don't know if there's anyone alive that has had an influence on safety in motorsport as much as him. You know, we, t we think a lot about the legacy of Senna. Clearly he passed away. Um, it, it's really interesting what you say about him taking you know, um, a lot of criticism at the time. I mean, did he go into, like, why people were critical? Is it to do with some sort of weird, uh, I don't know, is, is it going to cost more to be safe? Is it less macho? How, how could people possibly have been coming at him for trying to make it safer? Yeah, I think it's that macho element more than the cost, really. I think people are, oh, you shouldn't ruin the sport and stuff like that. And we've had we've had similar examples recently. Obviously, when the when the Halo come out came out, I think, almost all of the drivers were against it saying this is ruining 
Formula One. And like, how many drivers have we seen since then who's, whose lives have been saved by that, that piece of innovation? Like, I think people like obviously want to preserve the sport and sort of make it as quick and as fun as it can be. But at the same time, like, we don't want to end up in a situation where we're going back to like the number of fatalities in a year in a decade being like double digits. Like luckily we've, we've, we've gone a few years now before since the drivers died on the track. So I think, yeah, it's more of a trying to preserve what they think the sport should be. And like, I think that's why someone like Jackie Stewart is just so important because he's, he's, he's lived it. He's been, he's been in the cars. He's seen his friends die. Like he was talking about it, it during his days, like, if someone crashed and their car set on fire, like they wouldn't stop the race. Like they'd just drive through the flames, which is completely absurd to us now, but like that just the way it was. So like, if he's talking about safety, like he knows what he's talking about. So I think, uh, yeah, like you said, he's, he's definitely the most, he's had the biggest influence on safety. And I think we'd have, we've had a lot more people who, who would have died if it wasn't for his, his efforts really. Like, like even, even through in uh, like someone, he told me a story that someone wants for a brick for his window. Like that's how high this criticism got. And he still carried on. Like he didn't need to, like his time was done. Like he'd retired, like he could have just happily been a pundit or whatever, but he obviously felt it was that important to, to go on and do it. And like, I think the sport's a much better place for it. Oh, that's like a, a, an incredible level of vitriol, like throwing a brick. You'd have to work out where he lives and then sort of pass by and think, yeah, I'm going to just damage his yeah. property. It's like mad. It's incredible. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that, that's the stuff that's sort of reserved for like, I don't know, a dictator or something like that. Not so, not an F1 <laughs> driver, is it? Like, it's mad. <laughs> yeah, but it, do you know what? It shows that, you know, and I'm not trying to justify this at all, but it does show the level of passion that people feel about motorsport. Absolutely, it's like wrong. And I can't believe I'm going to say this, like don't throw bricks through people's windows for any reason. <laughs> yes. But like they've asked you because they're building a wall in their house and they need an extra brick. I don't know, but like, just don't do it. But, um, <laughs> I don't know. Like, but this point about passion in motorsport, like what do you think it is that, that elicits that passion? Because, you know, you see those fan bases going at it. You know, you see during the race, after the race, people streaming onto the track. What what do you put your finger on about like why, particularly Formula One, people get so passionate about it? Oh, it's a good question. I think maybe just the adrenaline thrown around it, because obviously it's it's a very very adrenaline based sport. Like I'm also a big cricket fan, but I'd think if you married if you measured the average heartbeat of a cricket player compared to an F1 driver, it'd be off the scale, wouldn't it? Like is a sport that's very high octane and sort of that, that bleeds out into the stands really. Like the fans do get very excited, very passionate about it. And I think that's something that's happened. Not maybe, I think they've always been quite passionate. I think this, this sort of tribalism has definitely come into the sport more recently, like maybe since Liberty Media took over, like I think definitely like we're now seeing situations like obviously the, the most obvious ones are like Mercedes fans versus Red Bull fans, or even to boil it down further, is Verstappen fans versus Hamilton fans. Like, there's obviously you can go on Twitter every day and find those two arguing with each other. And I, yeah, I don't, I don't know why that's happened particularly. I think there's just sort of some of that's happened. I guess I don't, know, I don't know if Drive to Survive contributes to that as well. Like, I'd be, I'd be interested if someone could come up with a concrete answer as to why like it's become more tribal. But yeah, in terms of the passion, I think it's just probably that excitement and that sort of makes you support, support a driver or whatever. And like, you're very, yeah, I don't think you find someone who supports a team who's sort of not all in really. Like it's definitely one of those sports where you're very much committed to it and you know what's going on quite a lot of the time. Yeah. And you mentioned Liberty media that they're, they're not, they're not stupid. Right. I, I, I swear, like I used to feel my heart, my pulse, just as um, you know, the lights were going out, but now they actually pipe that into the world feed. So like, they're kind of—I <laughs> suppose—they're trying to like play into that kind of adrenaline that you talk about. Um, no, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Like, yeah, I think I think their ownership's been really interesting. I think a lot of it's been quite good. Like, I don't think we'd have free races in America if we sort of continued as it was under Bernie. Like, they've done a lot of good stuff. But yeah, they they've tried to sell this this idea of competition and this idea of like the ultimate thrill and like. I think that's what their their big their big goals been, and like you can't you can't say it's not been successful. Like this, the sport is more popular than ever. It's making more money for them every year. Like the TV deals are going up and up. So yeah, like they're probably looking at it and thinking we've done absolutely everything correct. And like I'd be interested to see what their their plan for the 
for the next future is. Yeah, it's, a, it's a huge point around like the revenue raising of the sport. And, you know, maybe we'll get on a bit later about like whether that it, it's kind of like, I don't know, people that go to the gym and only do their upper body, like the revenue raising <laughs> and the kind of commercial sides growing. And then like maybe you look at the legs as like if someone skipped leg day is like the competence to run run a kind of global uh, organization uh, on, on the regulatory mm. side. I guess, I guess my question for you is like, clearly you're passionate about this. You're writing articles. Clearly you've got to make sure you're, you're delivering for Planet F1 and not necessarily like throwing too much of your personal opinion into, into the piece. How do you find that balance between, you know, your articles having a pulse, they are energetic, they're engaging, but that you aren't like inadvertently leaning to one direction or another? Yeah, that's a fair point. I think that's maybe something just you learn to do as you um as you go on, really. I think I've been lucky in F1. I've never really had like a team that I've supported. I've just sort of always been a general fan of the sport. I mean, I've got a little soft spot for McLaren, but that's not enough to make me like defend every decision or every move that's ever happened to them. Like I think I can still be quite critical of them. I think, yeah, you've just got to sort of not yeah, not let your own biases if you make like granted like we all like drivers different than other drivers but like, i think you've still got to be fair like if someone can look at your article and say that's fair like that's my job done really like i think if i can have a opinion piece where i sort of really argue my point and like fair enough you might not agree with it fair enough you might think it's completely rubbish but if you think oh he's just written this because he's a hamilton fan like whatever like that shows i've done my job wrong and obviously there was always going to be people on twitter who call you out i think I think I had a day where someone in the morning called me a Hamilton fan and someone in the evening called me a Verstappen fan. So in my mind, I'm doing something right because like they're both annoyed. So I must be talking to the truth and not, and not supporting their driver more than the other. But yeah, I think it's just something you learn of practice, really. And I think if you are the kind of person that sort of openly shows your big biases to one team and like you just write good things about that, I think people will soon suss you out and like they won't really respect what you've got to say, really. I guess there are two markets, aren't there? There's like the kind of news market or the kind of like descriptive market. And then there's the kind of like, I'm definitely in one camp or the other. And I think those are more sort of fan style. Um, you know, like, uh, I don't know, Quick Stop F1 would be a good example. Like They have a podcast. Mm -hmm. They're quite like, obviously on the Hamilton side, but they have quite a huge following, you know, and they could pack out like uh, cinemas, but you wouldn't expect, you wouldn't come to them expecting kind of, I don't know, uh, completely neutral journalism, whereas Planet F1 is a different, I guess, a different thing. Yeah, I mean, that's totally fair. Like, that sort of leads back into the different form of media that we were talking about earlier. Like, I think it's great that someone can say, okay, I'm a massive Ferrari fan. I'm going to start a Ferrari podcast. I'm going to talk about Ferrari all the time and, like, how much I love them. And, like, you're going to find there's fans that just want to hear the good stuff. And, like, that's absolutely fair. I think that's great. Like, I think people should make their own podcast if they're really passionate about something like, but like you said, there's definitely a line where we're sort of trying to cater to everyone. Really. We're, we don't want to be coming off as pro this driver or pro that driver. And like, like you said, it's, there's just two different styles really. And I think, I think those ones are great as well. Cause then they, they generate like the ultimate passion, don't they? Like if, if Ferrari do well or they don't do well and this podcast, this imaginary podcast is going to react to that. I think that's, that's just a different thing that people might want. Like, Maybe they don't want to know the in-depth news and stuff like that. And maybe they just go to here to sort of become another fan, maybe join in with that. But yeah, I think that's great. I think having those diff two different types of media is just only good for the sport, really. Well, look, if anyone starts an imaginary or not so imaginary Ferrari podcast, we expect royalties here. Uh, maybe to you, but you know, I'm, I'm going to claim some residuals as well. Uh, but there we are. Yeah, it, it is interesting, interesting actually on Ferrari. Maybe that it's all in Italian and I just don't notice it, but... There's a lot of passion in the Tifosi. I don't, and obviously people are like, you know, Leclerc fans or science to some extent. I don't see a lot in the English media of like Ferrari, like angled sort of media, but maybe that's maybe that's just me being blind to it or maybe it's in Italian, I don't know. Maybe no, I think that's fair. Yeah, I probably shouldn't use the Ferrari because they are such a specific example that it is very much Italy's teams. Like obviously we, we are like, just to give a bit of an insight, like often if news comes out from Ferrari, they'll give it to Italian media first and then sort of we have to react to that. There's never been a case really like where they're feeding us news such as the other teams are nice enough to do. So, yeah, I think Ferrari is a particular case that it is very much 
all of Italy seems to be a Ferrari fan. So I think I don't speak Italian. Like if I did, I'm sure I could find hundreds of podcasts slating the Ferrari decision every Monday and like, why did we do this kind of thing? But yeah, I think Ferrari may be, may be a bad example on my part. No, I mean, that's fair enough. We, we all need imaginary podcasts at some period. So look, I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to threaten your um, neutrality here because we play a little game uh, on the podcast, which I always get wrong. But essentially, it's called Taxi Dinner Avoid. So you've got to pick from the current grid. In oh, fact, okay. they're going to open it up and say like any grid in the F1, in F1 history that you, you sort of grew up with. Um, a driver that's going to take you to the dinner. So like, I guess it's on the driving ability. A driver that you're going to have mm. dinner with because you're going to get on with them. And then a driver that you're going to avoid. So so. Taxi, dinner, avoid, pick your three. Oh, that's a very good question. Um, immediately for taxi, I'm thinking like smooth drivers. And for some reason, Vettel really springs to my mind. I think like he'd have good chat as well, but not too much. Like that's what you want from a taxi driver. You don't want them to be talking to you all the time, but maybe some interesting lines, maybe some interesting conversations. And I think the taxi ride would be just completely smooth. You wouldn't realize you'd, you'd set off really. Like it'd be such a nice ride. So yeah, I'm going to pick Vettel for the taxi. Ooh, who am I gonna have dinner with? I mean, Ricardo's the obvious choice, isn't it? But I don't know if I could I could handle it for how many hours that I'm out with him. I feel like I'll get my energy drained. I just can't match that level that level of excitement. Um, who is it? Uh, I'm trying to think of someone else who'd be good. So you want someone with good stories, don't you? Maybe Fernando. He'd probably be a good dinner guest. I mean, how much he'd tell me, I don't know. Uh, I've always been quite a big fan of Pierre Gasly, but I don't think he's the dinner guest. So yeah, I think I'm going to go for Fernando. I think he's got plenty of stories to to at least get me through about two hours of dinner. Like he, he's definitely got some stories he can tell me. And I feel like he's the kind of driver that would. I feel like a lot of the other drivers would be coy, but as we all know, Alonso is is not afraid to say how he really feels. So I think I'll have him and someone to avoid. Oh, tricky question. Um. I'm trying to think of any driver now who I don't want to offend. Um, uh, oh, I'm going a bit blank. I think I think I'd struggle to get on with George Russell. I think we come from very different backgrounds. I feel like judging by his Instagram, he spends a lot of time with his top off, and I don't. So I feel like he'd want to have his top off, and I just, I can't get on board with that, George. I'm afraid. So I'll have those as my free. I'm sorry, George, but I'm going to have to avoid you purely for the topless picks. I don't want to engage in that. I don't want to engage in that. That's a perfect like delivery. <laughs> Fantastic. We always bury that avoid in there because I feel like that is the hardest one. Like the others mm. are slightly sort of complimentary. Um, and it's interesting. I mean, I don't want to get too deep and like put you on the Shay Long and do some like psychoanalysis, <laughs> but you talked about coming from different backgrounds. Is it largely the shirt off like desire or is it more sort of financial or socioeconomic? Yeah, or, or I'd say cultural? I think the 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 financial difference. Like I, I live in London. I see that he often posts from London. I'll just say that the parts of London that we we visit and live in look very, very different. Like I think I'd struggle to relate to his his upbringing compared to to mine, which happened in a small town in Devon in the southwest of England. So yeah, I think there wouldn't be as much for we want. There wouldn't be as much like get together chat. Like we wouldn't have much to relate to. And then he'd talk about going into f1 from an early age and i'd be like i wasn't doing that so i think yeah <laughs> i think we might struggle to find a neutral ground where we can we can chat i'm not gonna ag uh, sort of uh agonize the point here because clearly like we don't want to get you a reputation or f1 uh, planet f1 a reputation that you have some sort of agenda against uh george russell leave that to oh me. no no yeah. i'm sure he's a lovely <laughs> i'm sure he's a lovely guy like i you can't yeah, yeah. it's purely interests like cultural interest yeah, and yeah, yeah. Uh, it's choice right. the choice of having your top on or off i think that's where yeah. we'd we'd really come a cropper he, he also doesn't wear shoes in a lot of his photos but that's that's an aside we don't need to kind of go into that I, i'm sure yeah. it doesn't say um, much yeah, about his character. i'm also a big shoe fan I, especially if i'm going to a restaurant <laughs> i feel like i have to wear shoes it would be inappropriate not to. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> so, so at the beginning, you talked a bit about like, that's a nine to five. And you said, well, actually, I don't, don't really work a nine to five. Like, I'm not saying that you've got a timesheet in front of you, but like, what, what does a working week look like for you, both in a kind of race week, but also a non-race week? Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, like I said, it's rarely nine to five. So like, for example, with Austria coming up this weekend, like my hours will obviously be centered around the race, really. So for us, really, just going on purely on a Sunday, like there's not much point being on too early before the race because 
a lot of that stuff's already happened on the Saturday evening. There's not going to be a huge amount of changes. And then after the race, there's just a lot of reaction we need to work on. So that's sort of, I would typically start like an hour before the race and sort of work long until after it's finished really like that's if i'm not there obviously if i'm if i'm if i'm there it's a different story but if i'm if i'm working from home which i have to do on, on occasion like yeah that's sort of it and then it, luckily we've got a team and like we always sort of try and have one person on at most points during the day like i think someone will be on f- roughly about four or five o'clock in the morning all the way through to about nine at ten at evening so yeah i like to think we've got the 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 manpower or whatever to to cover breaking news considering the f1's largely european european like based sport like a lot of the teams are going out stuff in european european hours so i feel like we'd get that obviously if they're racing in the north america my time is completely different and like canada was a bit hard because it's obviously staying up till the early hours for me but yeah i think generally just reacting to the, the the races and how where what time they're positioned on a race weekend and then when it's not race weekend it's a little bit more of a freedom but like i said we always sort of want to have someone online because there's a lot of times we don't know the news is coming and we've got to react to it there and then so as long as, long as someone's in that position to do so that then that's fine by us and that's really intriguing you talk about sort of manpower or the size of the operation like is um planet f1 quite large or like do, do you get a sense no, of the colleagues you're working with? No, go on, yeah. Yeah, like, it's very small, to be honest. I think, obviously, like, we're part of a bigger network, so there's there's um, Planet Sports, sort of the, like, the overall head, but there's lots of different websites, like football ones, tennis ones, cricket ones. But on the F1 team, I think there's, uh, off the top, I'm going to forget someone, but, like, six or seven of us at work. So, yeah, it's a very small team, and, like, I think it is impressive, like, how much we get done during a week, really. And I think there's a lot of hard hard-working people on the side, which I think, helps and like i don't think you can do a job where i love a job like this if you're not really putting a lot of effort in so yeah it's not a huge operation like we're definitely one of the smaller in terms of numbers like someone like motorsport.com like they have like so many more people than us and that sort of reflects in what they can cover like we're very much a small group but i like to think we get a lot a lot done really interesting that you say like motorsport.com have like many more people because from like, as a punter I wouldn't necessarily notice that there is a kind of big difference. Oh, good. That means we're doing our job. Coverage. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, exactly. You should now petition to get, like, the total amount of salary that motorsport.com gets, but just divided by yes. fewer <laughs> people, right? <laughs> yeah. Can I get you I'm in on sure contract negotiations? Well. Can I phone you in? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, like, you record this as feedback for uh, your end-of-year <laughs> review. No, exactly, exactly. So you, you kind of mentioned an interesting sort of point there. You were like if I'm not at the race. So I guess the question that then follows is like, do you get to a few races a season or like what, how often yeah. do you get there? Yeah. As, as we can all predict, like it's very expensive to go out to the races. Like we're, I obviously I've mentioned before, I live in London, like we're a UK based company. So we're going to be focused on the European races mainly. We did have someone out in um, Bahrain to start the start of the year. And my colleague Thomas went to um, Abu Dhabi at the end of last year as well. Like, but from now, like, I was supposed to go to Imola, but we all know what happened with Imola. I'm going to Silverstone next week and then I'm going to Spa at the end of the month. So, yeah, it's very much like balancing the books, really. Like, we don't have an unlimited budget. Much, as much as I'd love to go to every race, I'd love to fly out to Australia and stuff like that. But, like, these, these come at a cost and, like, we can't justify it all the time. Like, we have to, like, sort of pick our battles, really. Like, if we know... I mean, one of the big reasons we were going to go to Imola was... A, because it's it's obviously quite a historic race, but we also knew like a, a lot of teams were going to bring their upgrades there. So we thought that'd be a perfect time to get someone out there. Obviously that didn't happen in the end, but yeah, I think like some of like Silverstone's obvious because we, we live near there. And then some of like Spa, where it's quite, again, like a quite an important race in the calendar. Like I think that's somewhere we're going to, we're going to focus on more really. And like, yeah, sort of get those out of the way and then sort of look after the summer break, okay, where can we do next kind of thing? So, yeah, I, like I said, I wish we we could go to every race. And I'm sure my boss does as well. But, like, it's just a case of the money, really. Like, we can't afford to fly out to the, the Middle East or whatever or to North America all that often. That's really that's really interesting. And I guess it's the reality of, like, running a, a kind of a small but hungry organisation in a, in a kind of expensive world. I mean, mm-hmm. looking at... Yeah, look, looking at Planet F1, you're, you're, you're at Grand Prix, like you obviously get your hotel, like what are you doing during the weekend? Are you going into those press, kind of press conferences and stuff like that? Or like what, what, what do you try and target during the race weekend when you're there? 
Yeah, so for us, it's the absolute perfect time to try and get interviews with these drivers. So, like, obviously, they're all there. They're all available. Like, the if people don't know, the first day of a race is typically the media day. So that's when you see the press conferences clips. But around that, they'll organize maybe, like, an open media session. So what that means is they'll say, the driver's here. You can come and record it. You might get a question in, you might not. But at least you can have other people answering what you hope are similar questions or something along that lines and do that. But like I said, the, the main thing you like, the absolute golden thing you could get is, is like an exclusive. And it would be something like a 10 minute chat. I don't want people to think that we've got someone for an hour. Like it's very much quick fire. The media team will line up like, I don't know, six or seven in a row for the drivers to do to sort of like bash them all out. And then, yeah, that's, that's the first day. And then the Friday will be obviously watching free practice or if it's this weekend, obviously making the sprint arrangements. And then after the final session of the day, there'll be another one like in the media pen. So if you ever see a clip of like someone being interviewed and they look like they're literally in a pen, that's where the media are. That's like the TV area. And there'll be like another written media area. And like, yeah, it's just sort of, it can be quite a hard challenge. I think have like, especially for a smaller side, like there's, you sort of have to be in two places at once really. But like, I think, that's just the way it is, really. Like you've just, unfortunately, you've got to be two places once. You've got to sort of judge what's best for you, really. It's like so. So those of you at home that you're listening to this and you've been to a Grand Prix, I suppose you're sort of moving around the circuit at your leisure. Um, you know, going to stand at a particular corner because you're interested. You know, doing some tourist stuff. Like, I guess the question, Sam, is like, how enjoyable do you find the race weekends? Like, if you're sprinting around, obviously you're a passionate fan of F1, but do you get to enjoy them or is it kind of mixed emotions? Um, yeah, I think it, you're sort of just more focused on the job, really. Like, you've always got something to do. Like, and even if I'm not at the race, like, if you're watching a race and you're doing, like, the live blog or something like that, like, it's obviously just a different challenge than sitting down and watching it like sometimes you'll be typing away like you might realize you spend half your time looking at your laptop rather than actually at the screen because you're busy typing so yeah i think there is a job to do in your mind like i'm obviously not enjoying it as much as a fan would sat up in the stands like they're obviously just free to watch it and do whatever but yeah i think i can't complain too much can i like if my if my office is next to a racetrack where some of the well the quickest drivers in the world are going around like I don't want people to think I'm complaining that, oh, this is a terrible job. But yeah, it's definitely, you watch the sport in a different way. No, absolutely. Yeah, and I don't think anyone's accusing you of like being ungrateful. I guess, um, <laughs> so like you're in Planet F1, you've kind of worked your way up through the big um, sort of national outlets. What's your aspiration or do you not plan like that? You, you're enjoying yourself in the current role, but like where do you want to go in in this game? Yeah, I think it's hard to plan too much. Like, I think it's, it's just such a weird industry. Like, if someone if someone asked me how to get into it, like, there's no set way. It's not like it's not like being a doctor, for example, where you go to medical school and you get an appointment at a hospital, whatever. Like, like, like as you heard from my background, it was very much like oh, taking opportunities when they arise. And sort of, I'm just sort of really enjoying this like job at the moment. Like, I'm lucky enough that I get to invite to a lot of cool events. Like, that's definitely a perk of the job. So you can go. I was lucky enough to go to the Alpine car launch. Like, that was an interesting time. Like, seeing Zinedine Zidane walk out from about six feet away from me. So yeah, I think I'm just like want to do more of what I'm doing currently. Like, I'd love to get to a position one day where like I'm going to every race, but at the same time, like I probably should be thankful that having heard a lot of people that do go there, like every race, like how taxing that can be. But yeah. I don't have too many. I'm not the kind of person that sits here going, okay, five years time, I want to be doing this kind of thing. Just because I think in this industry in particular, it's just not realistic to try and have those goals. Like something could change like instantly. Like I was back in my earlier days, like I got made redundant. Like I came out of the blue. So like, I'm always sort of aware that something could happen like that at any moment. Like sort of, yeah, I don't think you can have grand plans because you might get upset. You don't make them. Like you might do something completely different. Like you sort of just got to, be able to react on the fly really i just think that's sort of how i how i look at it really and i think like those that go through that early career like turmoil you kind of learn to i don't know enjoy what you've got but also i suppose make mm -hmm. sure you've you've got a plan right not putting all your eggs in in one basket so do you mm. do you have anything on the side that you're working on or like uh it sounds like a busy job so no it wouldn't blame you if you didn't but like You've got other things no you're, to be honest yeah about? like no I, like i don't to be honest like like i said it's quite a busy job like i work unusual hours so like 
try and enjoy the time off I have, but it's very much like a 24 seven job. So like I actually had a day off today and like, I'm still answering emails and stuff like that. Like it's just that it's the nature of the work really that like you've always sort of got to be on as much as you can. I think if I didn't enjoy it, I find that part a lot more challenging. I'm sort of get a bit frustrated, but I love, I just love it so much that if I get an email in my inbox, like, I'm absolutely happy to answer it as soon as I see it really. Like I'll, I'll, I'll get back to that person. Like, yeah, I think that's, that's key to like, being in this job is reacting quickly and stuff. I'll give you, I'll give you an good example actually. Like recently, um, I uh, went to Silverstone to like train like an F1 driver, and that came as an email. And they said they had four spots. So obviously, I don't know how many people they've sent that to, but if I wasn't one of the first people to to ring the guy up, like I'm not getting that getting that interview, not getting that. What turned out to be quite a good, interesting YouTube video. Like you've just got to be on it, kind of thing. As, as a good example, I guess like uh, passion goes a long way in in the game and uh i guess if you weren't you may be you may be sort of burnt out like how, how long is it that you've been following formula one as a, a journalist just sort of broadly oh like i think f- like, only like three years to be honest like when i actually got my proper like mm. first paid job in it yeah so like it's not been a huge time but other than that like doing some kind of journalism like for like, over a decade now so like obviously it started with the football and stuff like that and it's just sort of like I said, like I wouldn't have if you asked me ten years ago, would I be what would I be doing now? Like I wouldn't have guessed what this that kind of thing. It just sort of happened. So, so it's sort of like like it sounds a bit cheesy, but like riding the wave kind of thing, just sort of enjoying what happens now. And like, yes, it might not be the case in a year or whatever, like, but sort of deal that deal with that when it comes. Really, I mean, My it's like a driver that... away, I suppose. And like, oh sorry, yeah. I was just gonna say, no, like, no, it's like on. a driver. Like they probably they're probably. I mean, most of them are on one or two year deals. Like they don't know what's happening next year. I remember Valtteri Bottas was speaking about this is the first time in his career he's had a multi year deal. And like, if you think how long he's been it, like he didn't know what was going to happen next year. So like, I think it is important just to sort of enjoy where you are now and not try and overly think about the future too much. Absolutely, and and look, the three years you've covered have been like incredible in terms of mm. I suppose the profile of the sport the controversy, the kind of human angle. What, what's been your sort of, I don't know, like most noteworthy moment of those three years or, or the thing that you found sort of most incredible? Yeah, I think it's got to be that 2021 season, isn't it? Like just, it was absolutely mad. Like just the competitiveness of it. Like that, was, that really seemed like Formula One exploded in that year in particular. Like the popularity just got huge and huge. Like I think people are... I think Formula One does tend to leave itself to like having dominant forces just because like the regulation and stuff like that. Like you do get a lot of periods of dominance. So when when you have two drivers and two cars that are like so perfectly matched, I think that's sort of what that's like the dream for an F1 fan. And I think just that year, like it seemed like every race was something more different. Like obviously we had the big Silverstone crash and then you had the big the Monza crash. And then obviously finally that Abu Dhabi uh, Abu Dhabi race, like that was just if you wanted to make a movie about an F1 F1 season, you'd pick that season hands down because it's just incorrect. And especially in the recent years, obviously there's there's been great seasons down the line, but like since Hamilton like really became dominant, like yes, there was 2016, but like I feel like 2021 was like the perfect battle. And like I said, like I was talking about narratives earlier, like you've got like the veteran like uh, veteran champion who's won all these titles, and you've got the you've got the young kid who's who's the challenger, and he looks just as quick. And I think that season was just an absolute dream as a, as a reporter. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to say the phrase it wrote itself because I'm sure there was a mm. lot of painstaking hours <laughs> if you're actually writing about it, but like it had a lot of ups and downs and yeah, a lot of drama. Um, I mean, were you, um, were you sort of, I guess you were on shift covering Abu Dhabi and, and sort of following it. I, I, I think we look back at it now and we don't realize how little information there was or how it trickled out so slowly. But like, do you have any memories of, of Abu Dhabi 21? Yeah, definitely. It was just confusing. Like, I think if you listen back to the broadcast, if you've got the sky commentary, like Martin Brundle is, is like completely confused at what's happening. And this is a guy who's raced in F1. He's been it for decades. Like if he doesn't know what's going on, like no one does. Like it was so bizarre. And I think that was the thing that everyone, everyone was questioning really like, what led to that happening like one of my jobs i wrote on the monday was like sort of like a lap by lap like here's what happened like here's the decision that was made here's why why it happened like according to what the fii said and it was just yeah we're like you really like we sort of these events happen and we don't have like an inside line to the fia's brain like we can't 
just ring them up or like ring up the race steward or ring up Michael Massey and say, what did you do there? Like we're all sort of trying to get a little bit of information. And then obviously you have the stories that lead on to that. So obviously just ignoring the fact that Max is world champion for the first time, like you've then got Mercedes who are threatening like a legal suit. And like, it's just the story that snowballed and snowballed. And I think is one that's still like the most ferocious topic. Like if you mentioned it on Twitter, like you'd have a thousand people like saying one way or another. And like, it's just been a huge moment. Like, but yeah, back at the, back at the time, it was just confusing panic. Like, cause I think everyone, if people don't know, like often sometimes you'll have a, like a race report, like 90% written before the race is actually over. Cause you can sort of predict what's going to happen. But obviously in this case, it just completely changed. So you've got just to scrap what you've done and try and get up as quickly as possible. Like those reports that come up soon after the race is finished, like, that doesn't happen by magic. Like you've really got to be like planning it. So when something like this happens, you've got to go, right, get down as much as I know now. And maybe I can update it later on when facts actually start coming out. Yeah. I mean, uh, you guys must've had a lot of, uh, you know, smoke coming off the imaginary pen as you, <laughs> you know, with three laps or two laps to go and it all changed. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I talked about like, Formula One as a sport skipping leg day and that may be the regulatory side, the kind of governance side, not being as strong as like the commercial side that's growing leaps and bounds. Like what's your, do you have a view on, on sort of the FIA and like, do you see it kind of starting to grow a bit and get a bit more credible? Like how, what, what's your sort of perception of them and have you, have you, I guess, engaged them in your, in your time as a journalist? Yeah. Yeah. Like we do, we do. And I think like, Formula One's a weird sport where, like, I can't really think of another sport where you have, like, sort of two chiefs at a sort of level in terms of importance. So, obviously, like, F1 itself is owns the commercial rights and it's the Formula One group. But then sort of the rule makers are a different company and, like, they've got their own people leading it. So, I, I don't think there's another sport off the top of my head where it's like that, where you've got two warring factions, as it were. And I think F1, as in the commercial side, has done so well over the last years. And I think... FIA hasn't always painted themselves in the best light. Like I mentioned, like the Abu Dhabi stuff obviously set a lot of fans looking at them in a negative light. And I think that bridge has never been recovered really. Like even even the fact they've got a new president in and, and new directors and new race directors and stuff like that. I think that sort of that bridge was burned for a lot of people. I think yeah, I think they I think they're doing better, but I still think they make some baffling decisions. I, I just go back to that the jewelry incident of last year, like the, the war they seem to wage on Lewis Hamilton about not wearing your jewelry while you're driving the car. It just seemed like, why are you focusing on this? Like, there's just absolutely no need. Like, yes, it's in the rule book, but it's been the rule book since about 2005 and no one's cared since then. And you're only targeting Hamilton, whereas Kevin Magnuson was in the paddock saying he wears his wedding ring, like openly, and, like nothing came of that. So I think they do make mistakes like that sometimes, like, Obviously, the president himself has not painted himself in the best light, especially towards the start of this year, like had some comments about things he shouldn't make comments on. So I think in general, getting better, but I still think, that, still think there's room for improvement, really. Like, that, yeah, just making like competent race decisions where like people understand the reason. I do think they've got a lot better, to be fair. Like, I think this year, other than maybe that Australia end, but even then, I think that was their own regulations that sort of did them in. I think overall there hasn't been off the top of my head a load of decisions where you think why on earth have the stewards done that like i think it is a sport that does lead itself to using a lot of common sense when you can and i think thankfully they seem to be doing that a bit more these days yeah that, you, you've you've dredged up the memory of like albert park this year where yeah that was a completely weird ending where uh mm. they had a restart and drivers were like wrecking but they got to reassume their position or mm. you know like mm. not be part of it was a, and if, i guess it was their rules yeah it was a particularly weird ending yeah i think the problem with that is it just puts off fans doesn't it if you're watching that going oh, okay i've just seen this thing happen and then we're like oh but no that lap didn't actually exist like officially like ignore that but he's like but i've seen o ocon and alp and gasly i hit each other it was like yeah that happened but this part of the lap didn't happen it's just sort of like if you make it too confusing you're just going to switch off fans who aren't who aren't that committed and like, i think that's that's bad for the sport really like you've got to make clear decisions where it's obvious why you've done that like fair enough i know it was their own rules that they they had to like cross the first timing line or whatever so they can get official official timing but then again we had tv cameras like you can see who was in what position like 
couldn't you just use that? So yeah, I think you just got to do enough that the the casual view is not watching that going, oh, this this is pointless. Like, what is the point in having a fictional lap that doesn't officially exist in the FIA's mind? Yeah, and I think it does come down to like the regulations perhaps needing a complete uh, review because you're right, like you can get trapped following con contradictory rules and being lobbied by different teams. I mean, speaking of, um, you know, laps that didn't exist or laps that should have happened that didn't, clearly the Indy 500, which happened over a month ago now um, at time of recording, um, we had a bit of a funny ending. And I can see from your, your website, samcooperjournalist.co.uk, for those of you that want to go and visit it, that you've interviewed um, Pato Award and, and Felix Rosenquist. Mm -hmm. My... My uh, co-host, AMG Dens, loves Pato Award. Like, I call him mm -hmm. Pato Award because he seems to, like, have wrecked <laughs> a few times recently. Don't, uh, you know, don't steal that one. But, like, do you follow a bit of IndyCar? Is that more of a personal thing or have you done it for work? Um, I think it's always sort of with an F1 angle. So I think the reason I spoke to those two particularly is obviously that McLaren link. So, like, they're both McLaren drivers and obviously the F1 team in McLaren's there and the Zap Browns are big big on those. But yeah, I think there's it is an interest. Like it's, I can't say it's someone I watch every weekend just because a lot of times it clashes with F1 or I'm still working on F1 when it's on. But yeah, it's someone I've been vaguely aware of. And I'm sort of I'm always interested like who's there seems to be a big thing now, like who's gonna make the jump from IndyCar to F1. Like who's gonna do that? Obviously Colton Herter was the big name, but he seems to have dropped away a little bit and like Alex Palo sort of the next the next big talent I say big talent he's 26 I think but the next driver who could sort of jump across so I think yeah there's always sort of a work element in, involved in it but yeah just interviewing those guys I think that actually came through um I think his PR agency emailed us saying do you want to speak to these two drivers and I was like absolutely yes please like I, I can't even remember what sponsor it was that's that's a bad one but um yeah, it was just like a perfect chance to interview. And like, yeah, I think you've got every reason to really like Pat Award. He was just such a lovely guy. Like, I've managed to speak to him twice, actually. And like, both times, he was just super, like, sometimes you can interview drivers and their answers aren't always that interesting or they're quite short. But his were like, you could ask him one question, he'd be gone for ages. And it's like, that's absolutely ideal. Like, if someone's engaging with me, it's much easier to do a good interview. So, yeah, I've got I've got a lot of time for Pat. I think he's, he's a nice lad and I'd like to see him do well and avoid those walls that you mentioned. <laughs> And and like clearly, um, like he won't hold it against you that you've spoken to someone that, that joked about his name. But um, like, I, it would be remiss of me not to say that clearly the next McLaren driver from IndyCar that you need to interview is Alex Rossi, uh, who I happen to favour and who I think uh, has a bad rep. Uh, but yeah, I think he's a great is a great driver. So if you get another call from that PR agency and you're on your emails, uh, Alex, I will do. Oh well, yeah. <laughs> Hello. Fantastic. Now, obviously, I don't want to keep you too long. I can see again that you've you've done a bit of work on W Series in terms of you've interviewed Jamie Chadwick, who's obviously in the states mm -hmm. this season in Indy. Next, can you tell us a little bit about that? And like, was that around W Series? Was it just sort of around her profile? The fact that W Series was in the F1 paddock for a couple of years. Like, how did that come about, and what was that like? Yeah, I mean, I think that was me reaching out that time. It's definitely something I've I've been interested in. Like the, the fact that women haven't been, I say in the sport, in, in a driving position for how many years is it? I can't remember, is it like 40 odd? Like a long time. Like I think I'm really passionate about the next sort of women drive against sport and how long, how far away we are as that is from a sport. And I think W Series is obviously the natural place to start of that. I think it was it was really good, but like, it obviously ran into some financial issues. I spoke I spoke to the CEO as well. I think her idea behind it was good. And I just think it's an expensive sport to be in if you don't have the the big money behind the sponsor and stuff like that. So yeah. I'm, I'm really interested in the F1 Academy as well. I've been sort of, I've sat in a few of their um, press conferences, the virtual ones, and just sort of listened to what these young drivers are saying. Like, Eve, I think this is even before, they may have had one race or they hadn't had a race at all yet. But like, they're speaking out of these things, this this series has like saved their careers and you think that's crazy. Like this new series has already like done so much for these, these women like who can't afford to race or like if, if you listen to it, no, it's, it often comes down to sponsorship, but also like time in the car. Cause typically men go in go-karts from when they're really young and women often go in a lot later. So if you took, I don't know, like a 23 year old woman and a 23 year old man it tends to be that the man would have, 
hundreds, hundreds of more hours in a go-kart and just naturally be better at driving. So I think this F1 Academy, I'm really paying quite close attention to it. I think Susie Wolf is obviously a good person to be leading that because she's been she's been involved in F1. Like she she's the last person, last female to uh, participate in a session of F1. So yeah, I think it's always um a subject I'm interested in, like and unfortunately it doesn't always get the same amount of views. Like it's, it's just never going to compete with like actual big F1 news. But I think personally, I think it's something like really important that I should be trying to like pursue and say like, this should be going on more than it is. And like, yeah, it's like I said, it's just something I'm passionate about. I like, I want to see another woman on the grid. Like, and I think that they have every right to do it. Like, they're, they're good enough. It's just, they come from a less advantaged background where they haven't had that track time. They don't tend to get the same sponsors that the men do. That's that's really fantastic, and um, you know, credit to you to trying to bring profile to to those sports where you can. And we've had uh, Sabre Cook, who was like a, an American racing driver mm-hmm. in the first series and second series of the W Series, and and Taylor Ferns on the show, who's in USAC Silver Crown, which is sort of an overall racing circuit that uh, or, or, or competition that sort of has a flow into IndyCar, uh, albeit more of a historic one. So. Like, yeah, they both, basically, when you talk to both of them, they both talk a lot about sponsorship. They both work extremely Mm. hard to get the sort of backing that they need to compete where they compete. But also, like, they're extremely, like, impressive people. Both of them, like, one of them is, like, literally got, basically going to become a lawyer, like, really close. The other one's, like, masters in mechanical engineering. Like, these people are driven. It, it, It almost feels like they have to be at another level to kind of compete um, you know, in a world that has not given them any um, advantages or, or, you know, in a world that might be stacked against them in, in some ways. So, you know, kudos to you for, for covering it. And I hope you manage to get some interviews with uh, the F1 Academy grid soon, perhaps. Mm. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah, that's that's the goal. Yeah, like, and yeah, I think that like, you're right. Like, just the way it's set up is the, the women do have to work harder. Like, unfortunately, I'm, I, I hope, like, one of my big hopes is we get to a stage where, like, one of the questions you don't ask a female driver is, like, how does it be, feel to be a female driver? Like, you're not going to ask Max Verstappen, how does it feel to be a male driver, are you? Like, it's just not something that's going to happen. So I think if we get to a stage where it's sort of normalised and we don't feel the need to... Because I think that's just another pressure that's put on the women's sol- shoulders is they're, they're having to be representatives of not just themselves, not just their team, but, like, their their whole gender, their whole sex, really, like, sort of they have to be a a good role model for them. And like, that's just another layer. And we forget, it's so easy to forget. These people are so young, like the driving the F1 Academy, I think they're all either around the 20 year old or under 20 year olds. Like they're ridiculously young. And like, I was in a position when I was a a late teenager to sort of be representing a huge group of people, let alone like what they're doing. So yeah, I think that'd be the ultimate goal is just sort of when they can just be acknowledged as another driver, really like that'd be, that'd be perfect. Absolutely. And uh, no, it's something I've also observed. I mean, yeah, I don't want to reveal what I was doing when I was 20, but I definitely didn't have the kind of productivity, (laughs) sort of mental uh, kind of discipline, et cetera, et cetera, to be like so elite as these people. So like all all power to Mm -hmm. them. And hopefully we see that transition from F1 Academy, maybe into Formula 2 or something and then up into Formula 1. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's an exciting time. I'm I'm excited to see where that goes, really. Obviously, it's still very much the early days like they've had three or four races i can't remember the exact number but yeah i want to see sort of what's the next step for those drivers that have gone through that so like we we've gone deep and meaningful and so there's no easy way to make this segue because we ask like every guest that's in the show uh, a really fundamental and important question before we go um so presuming you like pizza and I like, I'm going to give you an out to say, like, tell me now, reveal now if you don't. I don't know. Do you like pizza? Oh, no, yeah. Big pizza fan. Yeah, you're on the okay, right lines. Good. I haven't met anyone that doesn't. So I'm glad you're sort of conforming with the eight, <laughs> eight billion that are on that side. If so you do, I hope you end the podcast immediately. If, they say, if someone says yeah. I don't like pizza, I would, I would delete the episode. I'm not talking to you ever again. No, yeah, just like have that sort of um, shut down windows sort of sound. Like, do, yeah. do, do, yeah. do, it's finished. It's over. Um, no, okay, so this is the fundamental yes or no question. Pineapple on pizza, yes or no? I'm going to say yes. I'm a big fan of pineapple. But here's a, here's a point for you. I'm vegetarian, and like, when do you ever see a pineapple on the pizza without ham? So like, I naturally just can't have it because I can't have the ham. If you could tell me another pizza that regularly has pineapple on it, 
than no meat. I'd be all about it. But like, I'm unfortunately someone who doesn't have pineapple on their pizza, not through choice, but because I don't eat meat. And like most of the time, it's a Hawaiian pizza, which has the ham and the pineapple. But yeah, in principle, yes to pineapple. So you've you've faced kind of indirect discrimination here. I feel like people aren't thinking outside yeah. the box enough here to. I want to. I want a veggie pineapple. Hawaiian. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, I don't know, like basically you need that salt content to balance the pineapple, but no one's worked out what's yeah. going to deliver it. Yeah. yeah, I don't know what the substitute is, because let's be honest, like veggie ham is just not good. So I don't want that on either. So yeah, it's it's one of life's great, great, great questions. Like how do I balance my pineapple and my pizza? But someone, one of those scientists will come up with a good way to do it. And I'll be, I'll be there. I'll be in their debt. He thought you were going to say it's one of life's great injustices, and that's when I was doing the podcast. Like, <laughs> maybe a step too far that one. <laughs> Just questions. Yeah, yeah. Like, well, look, uh, it's been fantastic, Sam, to have you. And look, if you're at home, you can follow Sam uh, at Sam Cooper with a little underscore at the end. Uh, I don't know who the other Sam Cooper is, but don't follow that. Oh, person. they don't. They don't even use their account. This is the annoying part about having quite a Crazy. common name. Is like they don't even use it. I'm like, just give it to me. It'd be so much easier. But He's still hanging on to it. You like, A, the person probably doesn't even check the DMs because they set it up in like 2009. But B, like if they knew you wanted it, maybe they'd set a price. And then, and then yeah. Mm, it's mm. Another one like is annoyingly, I think there's like a Canadian investigative reporter who also has my name. So I'll frequently get DMs from people saying, oh, you should investigate this. And I'm like, I don't know anything about that subject. I'm the wrong person to send this to. Maybe they've got the website like Sam Cooper Investigative Journalist. I don't know. Like we need to. Yeah, I uh... <laughs> I can give them an answer, but it's not going to be educated or like any thought behind it. Well, you know, maybe you can like fall back on that. You can put their CV onto your CV if you ever sort of leave the F1 world. Who knows? Who knows? But um, yeah, have you got other socials you want to shout out? Have you got Instagram or, um, or something? Yeah, like Sam Cooper on F, Sam Cooper F1 on Instagram. I really must post more on that. I'm dreadful. But I've got an exciting July, so hopefully I've got some stuff to post on there in the, in the coming weeks. Absolutely. If you're, like, going to, you know, Formula One weekends or Goodwood mm. or whatever, there's no excuse for you not to, to get those pictures up there. Exactly. So yeah. we look forward to following that. Fantastic. Well, look, before we go, is there anything else you'd like to add? I mean, it's been fantastic catching up and talking. But yeah, anything else you want to add before we go? No, no, I think I'm all good. Yeah, it's been a great, like I said at the start, thanks for having me. It's been a a, a lovely hour. Brilliant. And on your day off. So thank you. Uh, It's quite late where we are. We're recording this. It's uh, 20 past nine uh, UK time. So thanks for joining. And uh, look, I hope you have a fantastic July as you promised to have this episode. Hopefully people are listening to it on the first Saturday of July, so they can still look ahead to a fantastic July as well. Um, I've been your unusual co-host, F1 Blag. Thank you so much for Sam Cooper for joining us. Don't forget to rate us on your podcast uh, app of choice and look us up on YouTube where you can give us a thumbs up. Until next time, see you soon. Goodbye.